and as i told you last week uh, we did discuss about uh, containers and uh, you know we did see how these uh, containers can be built and uh, how to uh, you know how to virtualize your application uh, from a, a container perspective and uh, uh, how do you package uh, a binary and uh, libraries together with your apps and separate it out uh, from using your OS, right? So given this background, um, given this background, uh, you know, I just want to, you know, you know, talk about the Kubernetes today. Uh, imagine that you have, uh, you know, 25 plus containers to manage. You know, I it's you know we saw how how we can uh, deploy or run a container, but if you have to run some twenty five uh, plus uh, containers and in different uh, nodes or with different virtual boxes or different uh, physical machines as well, it's very difficult to manage it. And given that uh, in today's world you might have very different kind of uh, uh, environment where you might have different different services. Um, each services might have 20 plus containers. Uh, that will be a real difficulty of managing it. So Kubernetes solves that problem. It orchestrates containers. Uh, it basically gives you an interface where you can, um, you know, where you can manage your workload deployments. And it is basically a, a abstracts. It abstracts your uh, hardware. It's a kind of an interface uh, where you go and uh, define what you want and uh, and then kubernetes takes that information and uh, drives that information within the hardware uh, you have provided so uh, it's it's nothing but a you know it's nothing but a high level uh, language uh, for uh, application architecture so it it, it is uh, you know it's it also makes sure that uh, whatever information you have given or whatever data you have provided or the desired state which i say right you know the desired state uh, which you provide to the kubernetes it mm -hmm. takes that uh, state and uh, make sure uh, that state is maintained and it it always uh, uh, you know creates a kind of a environment where uh, whatever you have input uh, whatever the you know information you have uh, passed it on to the kubernetes it has taken that information and uh, uh, made sure it has deployed it onto the you know hardware which you have uh, provided. So uh, to give you a you know complete uh, overview, right? I mean, I've, I'm anyways going to talk about the architecture and other things, but Kubernetes is a declarative uh, declarative tool. Um, it's not a imperative. When I say imperative, um, you know, imperative is where you tell uh, you know step by step what to do and how to do it but uh, for from a kubernetes perspective it is a declarative one that means where you are just telling it this is the state i want and just giving it to the kubernetes and it will just take that information and uh, it drives it it on it on it only designs the way it has to deliver it and uh, everything it has been designed by kubernetes itself so you are not doing any activity apart from telling you please manage these things and it will take that information and manages it in the way it want to manage it and uh, it gives you all the other information uh, to make sure that you have the clarity on the uh, deployment which you have done so keep this in mind it is basically an orchestrator it is orchestrating the containers the more number of containers it's easier to orchestrate using kubernetes and it gives you an interface where uh, you're actually you know deploying these worker you know workloads uh, that is the containers uh, it, it is giving an interface to do it uh, and also it is abstracting the hardware itself uh, you're not even interacting with any of these hardware you're not even managing it and you don't know uh, where these uh, containers are running and all those things you're just making sure that these containers are running and you just want to see that information that's it so it gives you an abstract layer for that and uh, you are giving a desired state. That means you are telling, uh, I want five of these containers to run. And you are just telling that to Kubernetes and Kubernetes is making sure that five is running. Uh, if one 
goes down it will make sure the uh, desired state is met again it will create five uh, other state of the container uh, i'm calling it as a container for a purpose because i am not introduced you to the um, you to the concepts of kubernetes but uh, keep just in mind everything is uh, run as a container at the end of the day um given the orchestrations you know there are a couple of elements of orchestration uh, this is the elements of orchestration. We will, in this uh, specific uh, session and the next session, I will try to cover almost all the uh, elements of the orchestration. One is scheduling. You know, somebody needs to schedule these containers and uh, there has to be a process to schedule these containers. There has to be someone who is taking care of um, uh, how to schedule these uh, containers and where to schedule these containers. And affinity and anti-affinity is meaning is, um, you know, you want specific containers to run in specific hardware, um, you know, specific, uh, you know, specific structure of a hardware, or probably, you know, you need this, this specific hardware for uh, this container. So you want there are certain rules you can define. There are certain, uh, you know, uh, rules where uh, you can say. Uh, these containers should run in these set of nodes or these set of uh, places, right? And uh, or these set of containers should run together. Uh, there are certain rules you can create. So orchestration should provide those um, uh, those functionalities. Health monitoring is always common, right? I mean, it has to be there in your system. If you are running something, uh, the monitoring of that is is a given, right? And that has to be there. I did talk about failover. That means if you have told that you know you need five containers to run, and there has to it has to maintain that five containers in the production. So this failover uh, in a failover system which we are talking about is if something fails, that if one of these uh, container fails, it has to make sure uh, the fail uh, the failed uh, container is restarted. So that is something which uh, Kubernetes provides, and then there is scaling and. Uh, this is uh, this is the main reason why we all use Kubernetes, right? And and uh, we need to scale our applications, and it has to be uh, various ways to scale. And we will see in next session how to scale um, your applications, uh, how how it can scale, and I'm probably we'll do an amazing demo as well for that. And there is uh, networking which is required, and that means how does he different containers talk to each other, what is the various rules we can have, and how do we control uh, these containers talking to each other, like not all containers, talk, you know, we want to let everyone talk to each other, right? I mean, it's it's kind of uh, not a policy we want to run through. And then there has to be a service discovery, and it, I will talk about services uh, in coming slides and coming uh, demos and other places, but somebody needs to discover uh, discover these containers uh, discover these containers when in very specific way right you know there has to be a way to discover these containers there has to be a naming there has to be some set of uh, rules uh, where how you get can be accessed so that is very important and then uh, coordinated apps uh, upgrades right that means how do you do a deployment of uh, next versions how do you do a rollback and how do you you know push new um, new code and uh, how do we new versions go into go in with the container so if you have many containers which containers gets replaced which containers is not replacing and uh, in which no in which uh, you know the infrastructure it has to replace so all these things has to be uh, you know has to be a simple way to use it and uh, the orchestrator provides an interface for you to uh, drive all these things and it it automatically manages few of these things, but also it provides you an interface where you can uh, add all these uh, structure. So, um, so keep, I mean, I just want to go back to, um, uh, back to my, back to my slide here. And I just want to give, uh, I mean, this is, this is very important because uh, Kubernetes is, is a little bit complex. If you come from a background of traditional uh, traditional production management, or if you come from a background of traditional production development, and you know, you know, uh, you know, 
pushing your code to the productions in a way it was previously done and you're completely shifting to a new containerization and then using Kubernetes. Uh, there are uh, you know, some of the concepts you need to understand and there are some uh, basic, uh, basic uh, ideas, uh, basic terminologies which needs to be understood. Uh, so to just keep this in mind, it is orchestrating it and it is giving you uh, an interface, uh, do a couple of things and it is going to maintain the state which you have provided. And these are some of the elements which we discussed. Uh, it, it, it makes sure all these uh, things have been taken care. And coming to how it works, right? I mean, there are, uh, you know, it's no simpler way to explain this. You know, it's very, uh, you know, it's very uh, interesting. Uh, as a user, as I told you, you're going to define the, uh, you're going to define what you want. So this is, this, you have an application and you are telling this is, uh, you know, this is a structure. This is, this is, a, uh, this is the node, uh, you know, what should be my infrastructure? This should be, this is the number of replication of this container I want to run. When I say replication, it's nothing but identical copies of these containers. This is the number of uh, replication I want to run uh in the in the in the in the, uh, in, the uh, in the hardware and you are going to talk about uh you know what you want in terms of uh where which of these uh, services needs to be internal which of these services needs to be external so you're going to specify we're going to see that yaml file with the the object model uh, and we will obviously see in the demo like how it can be structured and what needs to be uh, inputted and obviously it's a it's little bit of uh, you know it's little bit of new programming uh, language kind of a thing for you right you know as of if you're getting started uh, there are a lot of elements uh, to understand but as and when you build it you will understand the whole structure um, so you are defining that YAML and uh, that YAML you are inputting into the uh, into the cluster. So if this diagram, you see this, uh, there is a master and there is a slave. And it's a, it's a very simple client, any client server model, this Kubernetes is also a, a client server model. And there is a master and there is slaves. And if you see uh, in, a, in a master, there are a couple of components and in, and, and in the, and in the, uh, and in the client and the worker nodes, there are a couple of uh, components. And don't take it as an agent nodes, and I'll call it as worker nodes. Uh, mm -hmm. Just keep that uh, in mind. And um, and in the diagram, you can actually see there are a couple of uh, services. And from the master node, there is an API server. So if there is an API server, there has to be a client which is accessing this server. So there is something called as kubectl, which is uh, API endpoint. So you can install that on your laptops or on, on the any of the virtual boxes uh, where you are interacting with the uh, interacting with the Kubernetes cluster. So whenever you deploy uh, a Kubernetes cluster, you deploy master node and worker nodes. So you can add n number of worker nodes. You can attach uh, different worker nodes. If this one, one worker node goes down, you can actually create one more worker node based on the policy which you have. And also you, will, you can add um, in a pool of worker nodes uh, on scale. You can add more worker nodes and destroy worker nodes. So it's all, it's all in the uh, it's all in the scaling part of the Kubernetes. Uh, I'll come to that later, but the, in the master node, uh, there is API server and you take your YAML file and we will see the structure of YAML file later, but you have designed the desired state and you hand over that specific uh, YAML file to API server. And what does API server do is uh, it goes to, you know, you can see that there is two, two components. One is control manager and a scheduler. So uh, the YAML file is decoded by the control manager and it figures out what exactly need to be done uh, from a user perspective and it handovers the, the scheduler and tells the scheduler, can you uh, bring, bring out a plan to execute 
uh, this specific desired state. So what does scheduler do? It's scheduler go and talk to the X set, which is the database. If you see at the bottom, there is a database, uh, which is a distributed database. It's a memory database. It's a key pair value database, basically. Uh, it exit exit uh, uh, you know the main job of exit is to store the status of the cluster so everything uh, with respect to the cluster is stored in the exit and exit has the uh, all the details of this cluster and status of the you know, running uh, containers and uh, scheduler uses that information and bring us brings out a plan to execute uh, your uh, your specific uh, you know, YAML file or the desired state and hand this over to control manager and control manager talk to the worker nodes via the kubelets. And if you see the worker node, right, there is something called as kubelet. It is a simple binary installed on all the uh, all the worker nodes, uh, which has all the information about the, about the node. It is also understanding what, what containers are running, what is the status of these containers? You know, uh, everything, you know, information about uh, anything and it is running with Docker. And uh, it and if you see that, um, you know, in the diagram, right? There are containers which are running in the in the worker node. Uh, so that is, that's how Control Manager gives that handle to uh, Kubelet. And if one of the container goes down, uh, Kubelet informs, uh, control manager and uh, with, through scheduler, it again figures out if uh, we need to run it in different nodes or it has to be in the which node we can run. Uh, and then uh, control manager again provides the information back to the kubelet and kubelet actually runs uh, the, uh, the containers uh, as per the plan provided by the scheduler. So take a look at this diagram. Um, you are not doing anything. You are just telling this is the state I want. Um, you know, uh, I'll just we will obviously I'll uh, after this. Um, you know, we will I'll go through a simple example where we can understand this whole structure better. Uh, where you are just telling the state and handing over the handle to API server, and the desired state uh, is decoded and scheduler schedules it and controller takes it back to the uh, worker nodes and it is interacting with uh, kubelet and then kubelet is actually providing the information back uh, to the uh, you know to the uh, master node and again it is running in a uh, in a loop right and it is trying to figure out and it is trying to manage it on its own and you are absolutely no idea uh, where these containers are running so it some of the container all the containers you mentioned uh, might be running on uh, one of the worker node or it can be running on uh, both the worker node and depending upon uh, the set of uh, replications you have provided it, it could be uh, running everywhere right so it's it depends on the way uh, you have planned it so just for an example right i mean just to trying to understand uh, this whole thing so i just want to you know give you a kind of uh, explanation like uh, how you can think about this. Say if you have a warehouse, okay, and you want to manage, and in this warehouse, uh, you have uh, one, two, and three rooms, okay, and imagine you are, uh, it's kind of a warehouse where you are managing all the goods of, uh, you know, iPhone or the Apple. So uh, let me put this as a uh, one to three rooms you have. And uh, then you have, you know, uh, Apple phone, Samsung phone and Redmi, whatever. So there are three different kinds of phones you have. And within Apple, you might have a version one, two and three, uh, which has version one can be thousand, uh, thousand, thousand you know, copies of version one, uh, which is I can have iPhone 11, uh, thousand pieces or something or 500 pieces, 400 pieces, 4,000 pieces uh, for uh, the latest one, which is 12 and probably just 300 pieces for the old ones. So similarly, you might have it for Samsung as well, right? So it could be version M 
some M series, J series, and what not the other series, whichever they have. Similarly for Redmi as well. So imagine you have thousand containers, you want to store it in warehouse one, two, three, and how would you do that? You know, if you want to do that and uh, you need somewhere, you know, some plan, right? So basically what you do is uh, you are uh, planning the state. Say, for example, you are telling uh, in, in the desire.yaml, you are actually defining what, uh, what you want. And you're telling this is the number of, uh, this is the number of uh, copies I have, and this is the uh, hardware I want. This is the number of CPU I want, or some similar to that. So this is the space I want and other things in the warehouse, your desired state is that. And imagine the same way the next you are, uh, you know, once you have told that somebody has to read this and uh, figure out this, you know, uh, somebody has to read this and decode your plan and give it to someone, right? And that is how that is the role of the control manager. And the next is the scheduler, which is actually, uh, you know, scheduling it. Basically, it is scheduling with, with the database. So there has to be a tracker to track all these uh, information and uh, put this information back to the warehouses where it has to go. So now it, you can have Apple 4 in room one, two, three, both all the three places or just in one place or in or might be in two places. So it is how this guy designs uh, his uh, plan to host these, uh, you know, these number of pieces of uh, Apple phone, right? So basically this is tracked via database, the Excel, which I talked about, uh, he could, he, he might be tracking it an Excel sheet, but it, it's, if you, if you take it in the Kubernetes uh, world, it, it is tracked in a, in a proper uh, way in, in terms of database and it's a memory database so that it is always available and it's faster. And, uh, and somebody is actually uh, managing the whole process and making sure uh, they manage these set of uh, pieces in three different forms. And there is someone at these rooms uh, who is managing uh, the space. So for example, in, in one, I might have 300, uh, you know, 300 pieces of Apple, uh, 400 pieces of Samsung, and probably 10 pieces of, um, you know, the uh, Redmi. And somebody is managing this and somebody is seeing this. And if something is lost or if something has gone wrong, uh, it informs the right set of people here. And it, it again, makes sure that this is uh, filled. So uh, it's kind of, you know, you, you need to take uh, and this analogy with the Kubernetes. It's, it's the same. And you know, I just uh, wanted to, you know, uh, give you overview of this. Uh, so uh, it's the same fashion. It works. You know, there is um, you giving the desired state, API server taking, control manager decoding, scheduler uh, using XED. It gives it back to control manager, manages with cubes, kubelets, and kubelet is giving back information. So this is how communities work. And uh, let me give you this link. Um, and now this is where you can actually learn all these concepts and also do some kind of hands-on uh, hands on sessions and very wonderful series by Bernard Burns himself, um, which is there on the basic of Kubernetes. So uh, please go through this link and download uh, that specific, uh, you know, PPT, uh, sorry, the specific PDF file uh, where it gives you a path to learn. And I, I just love this uh, day once, uh, Fifi goes to zoo, you know, it's a couple of things I've picked from uh, the Fifi goes to zoo in my next few slides. Uh, just to give you, um, core concepts, right? You know, it's very important to understand some of the concepts. I was talking about containers and containers and containers um, while I was discussing all the concepts uh, previously, but it is in a communities, uh, you know, terminologies and concept and the language, it is called pods. Uh, basically, it's a, you know, running container in the communities. It's a simple uh, set of containers or it could be a single container. Uh, so think that it is it's something called as pods and it is 
uh, basic unit of Kubernetes. And that's, that's the one which is always running. And these pods uh, can, just remember, it can be a single container, it can be a multi-container. So keep that in mind. And then there is uh, namespaces. Uh, namespace is nothing but a logical structuring of your uh, logical structuring of your infrastructure. So as I told you, right, you know, in a, in a, uh, in a warehouse one, and then there is one room, which I talked about in that room, you can actually logically structure your room in such a way that in, in the left corner, you want to put Apple phone in the right corner, you can put the Samsung phone and, and in the you know, top layer or the other corner, you can put the Redmi phone. So you can actually logically, you know, create a plan or like that, right? And similar to that, in, even in your infrastructure, you can create a, a similar logical structure and uh, make use of uh, that, uh, that partition. Okay, and services, uh, I did talk about services uh, previously. Services is nothing but a method to access these pods, uh, the you know, workloads, you know, it is way of exposing your workloads. How do I access uh, so many uh, pods which is running? Which pod I need to access? So each pod is structured into a name and it has a label, it has been named after and it is part of a specific namespace. Um, so if you know, do I, if I have to tell you in, uh, in, in the warehouse, uh, in the room one, uh, there is one uh, specific uh, you know, namespace for Apple phone. And then there is in Apple phone, there is, uh, you know, Apple 11, Apple 12, whichever uh, is the phone version. Uh, that is where the naming comes, the labeling of these uh, services, which is running, right? So then these, the way to access it is where the service is defined. So, and there are various ways to access and that anyways, we are going to see it in the, uh, see it in some, you know, some of the examples which we are going to have. So, you know, if, if you take an example, you know, I've just put a screenshot out there uh, where, you know, if you have a, you know, engineering namespace uh, and then there is a block service which is running and the, the pods which is part of the block service is available within that namespace. And to access that each pod, uh, you have to reach the block service and then you can access it. Instead of accessing the individual pods, uh, block service actually defines uh, which pods to pull out or which pods to talk to. So uh, this is also part of the scaling. So pods internally might have uh, n number of containers or just a single container. So this is a couple of uh, core concepts. Um, and, uh, and then um, replica sets. So, so I did talk about uh, you know, having identical copies of pods. Uh, or containers, right? I mean, pods is nothing but a container, as we discussed. So, you know, there there could be uh, identical copies of these uh, uh, pods. So you want to make sure that you know these uh, the number which you have provided in your desired state is always met. So what happens is, say for example, you have put as a replica count four in your desired state definition. Uh, that means that this specific um, this specific uh, replica set or this specific pod uh, is maintained. The four number is maintained. If something happens to one of the uh, pod, there is a new pod gets created uh, uh, in based on the available resources, of course, in the infrastructure. Uh, so scheduler actually defines uh, that where it can run this specific pod and. Uh, so this replica set is nothing but is a it's a running replications or identical copies of your uh, pods, which is nothing but containers uh, in different nodes, or worker nodes, or it could be on same worker node, or it could be on two worker nodes and not on the third worker node. It all depends upon uh, the scheduler's uh, information to run this specific uh, specific pod. So. Um, it is defined by scheduler, but when I come to daemon set, it is completely different. You know, the you know, daemon set is nothing but uh, same as replica set, but 
it is in a such a way that at least one copy of uh, the container or the pod uh, is running in each worker node. So it requires one copy and one copy has to run in the node. In replica set, you know, it's not necessary. It has to run in all the worker nodes. In daemon set, it is necessary to have at least one copy of the uh, pods or the container, which is part of the pods are running in the nodes. So if you see all three nodes, all three worker nodes uh, is having a pod running, right? So this is where, uh, the power of uh, mm. Kubernetes comes into picture where if you're doing some kind of configurations of software, if you're doing some you know installations of software to run your applications and you can easily define daemon, it as a daemon set and use it. In fact, if you just spin up a new node, this pod automatically get created in that new node. So uh, it is not even, uh, you know, you don't have to even worry about it. So as I told you, right, it's a declarative. You just tell this is what I want. And these pods are part of daemon set and Kubernetes make sure that this is the infrastructure is set in such a way that these uh, pods are running uh, in each of the nodes, uh, which is required. And this is, uh, I mean, I just want to give an example of this, how you can do this kind of deployments. Um, you always, I mean, you know, Elastic, Elastic has something called as metrics beat, uh, our file beat, but metrics beat is to get the metrics of the node that is worker node. So you are running Kubernetes nodes and you don't want to go into these nodes one by one and install metrics beat every time. And if you create a new node, you don't want to go and create one more metrics beat there to get the information, get the metrics of these nodes. Instead, what you do is just go and uh, you know create a metrics beat as a daemon set and apply it on the cluster. And what happens is all, all the nodes, which is part of that cluster, gets these metrics beat installed or part being running on that and get the information from the nodes. And then if there is a new node, which is coming up, it's under the cluster, you know, this metric which gets installed there as well without you even doing anything. So that is the, you know, uh, amazing abstraction layer of uh, Kubernetes, which is giving you to manage your infrastructure and other things. So very important concept. Um, and deployments. So deployments is nothing but how do you roll it, roll the updates, you know, how do you roll back? Uh, how do we pause some of the, uh, you know, some of the replications of version twos or version threes, which is going in? Um, and how do we pause at the version one, uh, which is running and uh, create new, uh, create new, uh, new versions of your pods. And, and this is, I mean, this we will see in, uh, our next session as well, how uh, how and probably different uh, ways to do this. And there are various uh, strategies you can use. And we will see some of the strategies in the next discussion. But in this discussion, just remember that you can, you can replace your pod with version two and, uh, and version one don't die off. It is still there. It has some grace period. Um, uh, some seconds or some minutes or something. Uh, it is still available and 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 slowly it actually moves one after the other. So uh, the version one is still available to the end user when version two is there on the other node. Uh, so basically, this is an interesting and very uh, you know very 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 complicated way of uh, doing deployments. So. It's nice. Uh, so given this, I just want to go back and show you a couple of things. So let me come back to the code. Cool. Um, this is very important. So this is the object model and this is the uh, desired state designing. This is the uh, you know, high level code you are going to push it to the uh, push it to the Kubernetes uh, API server. So, uh, you know, you know, you know, to understand this, uh, most importantly, uh, we need to understand that why they have chosen YAML. YAML is, uh, you know, very interesting because it is key pair values and and uh, it is also indented. 
so you can you know you can see that you know it is a high indentation uh you know indentation design right and uh, it, you the indentation has to be right uh, so that you know you can actually uh, design it right and it will be invalidated if the indentation is wrong so uh, to make sure that this design and the way you design it uh, is met so yaml is been used so dot yaml file is what you need to create and uh, basically uh, you know there are couple of things you need to remember um, just to give you there is metadata there is api version and it depends upon the kind of deployment you are doing so it's basically you are uh, you know if you're telling you are doing a deployment kind and it has its own api version and if you see here if i'm doing a kind service it has its own api version it's right and it has its own api version right so you are actually defining uh, which API version you are using and kind of deployment and metadata is just a you know kind of data meta information about the deployment you are trying to do and the difference between service and deployment is deployment is uh, giving an information of the infrastructure the resources you are trying to deploy the container which you are trying to deploy and uh, you know which is which is the node you're using Linux boxes or Windows box, whatever, or, and the label, the name of the, uh, name of this specific, uh, you know, pod, which you're going to deploy and number of replicas you want, which I mean, here it is one, you can have more number of uh, desired pods you want to run. And, uh, you know, a couple of things, uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, uh, you know, you can add, and metadata is just an information about the specific things. So, but different from service is that service is to access uh, the pod which is there. So if you see here, you can, you know, the name of the uh, metadata is again, what bank and Azure what backup, right? And so if you see here, uh, you know, it's been designed and this port actually matches and it is the way to access this specific uh, uh, this specific service. And you can also see it is access where the port, and you can see the port has been matched and the name of this will be matched to this. So it is different, right? Deployment is having different set of spec uh, and uh, API has different set of specs. Uh, you need to understand uh, service kind has different spec deployment kind has different spec and there are various other kinds of deployments as well you know you can say ingress deployment is there uh, as well and uh, we'll we'll try to see this uh, when we do uh, you know kind of next session and I'll, I'll try to cover that as well but um, you know just for understanding you need to design the desire state you need to tell which image to run this I'm running a Redis image and with what needs to be there and what is the uh, resource I want, uh, what is the CPU limitation I can give and port number I want to run it and name of the uh, name of the pod which is going to run and what is the app name, um, you know, I can access it. What is the label name I can access it. So everything I'm uh, defining it and, and you know, keeping this as a YAML file, the same way as I'm gonna create a service on top of it to access it. And same way, I'm gonna create a front end to access the back end. So there is a front end deployment. I'm using similar kind of information uh, for this as well. You know, you can see container running. It's a, it's a UI where I can access this specific uh, code. And then there is version of the service, right? And um, and if you see here, I am trying to access it via a load balancer. So, you know, there are three types which you can mention in your uh, service, uh, the way you want to run this, right? The type, the type can be cluster IP. Uh, you know, if you say cluster IPs, it's, it's, uh, it's only internal. So that means the service, the, the service get attached to the pod is and the pod is can be accessed internally within the uh, cluster only and when if you add it as a node port uh, node port is anyways uh, uh, available uh, 
you know to access the pod uh, directly without load balancers um, and you can just give the uh, ip it, it node port gives out a ip address to access it which is an external ip address where you can uh, go to that ip address and the port number which you provide if you provide that it will be able to uh, you know it will be able you will be able to access the pods which is running for that specific service but in a load balancer uh, is to balance the load and uh, make sure that you know um, it is being provided by the uh, by the cloud providers you just need to apply these uh, load balancer rules and then it can be accessed via load balancer and these uh can be uh and the load can be balanced you know that is you know the number of requests coming can be handled uh across these services and the service can uh, you know go and uh you know reach out to right set of pods uh based on the uh pods which are running in different different nodes right that is the work of node balancer but then there is ingress and other things which is there which we are going to discuss in the uh next uh session but this is how you can actually define so imagine you have some couple of you know containers to run and you define the deployment structure you define which port everything and then you define service here i'm not mentioning how to do it right i mean if you see here you are telling i want this access this particular service via load balancer i want to access this particular service uh, internally uh, for redis i want to access it internally uh, i want the replication set for uh, you know replication set for uh, this specific uh, specific deployment uh, one replica of this and probably one replica of the other you can also change this to five or two whatever if you want to uh, it's based on the requirement so this is the structure of the code and and let's see how you can actually deploy this in the uh, in the communities world, right? So, so uh, I'm uh, using you know, Azure Community Service. I just come to uh, I've already deployed uh, one of the in a cluster, but I want to show you how to deploy it because it takes a little bit of time. So I just don't want to you know, spend time in terms of uh, waiting for deploying it. Um, so you come here. You create your own, um, you know, create your resource group. You give a cluster name, and you use whichever region you want to deploy. It's already there, zero zero one. It's not there. So something something you mentioned, and here is the you know version of Kubernetes. You know, the, obviously the latest. It's 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 in the preview, but you can actually pick the latest one or the one which is defaulted here, and you can choose the number of nodes you want by default it is always three and you can actually mention it as two and you can select the size whichever size you want uh based on the you know b series and other things whichever 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 suits you i select b2 as and then go to the node pool and you can see here there is you know you can add more nodes uh, based on the scale you know if there is more number of uh you know request coming into your kubernetes cluster you want to add more nodes to it whenever it is required so how do you design that so you can add some of them and uh, there is something called as virtual nodes we will see that in next session how to use uh virtual nodes uh anyways i've given that uh just for uh, understanding purpose um and again scale set and other things which is already part of the azure uh, services and a couple of things we can uh, enable is uh, how you want your os how to access this role based access in kubernetes uh, and how do i enable act azure active uh, directory uh, service which is there and networking is very important you know uh, azure it's, itself provides its own um, uh, container network interface where you can provide all the details out and it is it's already by defaulted and you can actually use however you want and then some of the load balancers and other things which has been provided uh i don't want to go deep into these um and did we did talk about uh container azure container registry in our previous talk uh you can actually use uh the container registry uh, whichever you have created uh so that all the containers 
uh, is stored in these registry and you're accessing the containers from this registry in your through your yaml file so that is something which you can do and then monitoring and uh, visible monitoring and other policies and other things which you can use for and just review it and then create so um so it's so simple just to create your infrastructure and your infrastructure is ready and once your uh, cluster is ready uh, you just need to submit your yaml file to the cluster right and it's so uh, simple uh, let me go back um, to that i don't i don't want to create it i already have uh, the kubernetes cluster so this is my cluster i have already created the cluster so i want to access this cluster now and uh, create a you know run my yaml file there and create a you know certain set of code there right and uh, let me access it so i just create a cloud shell to use it create storage so i can easily access all these uh, services right so uh, cloud cloud shell is an amazing uh, feature where everything latest is been installed uh, it's already have it installed like docker is installed kubectl is installed uh, kubectl is is the client which accesses the kubernetes right so it's the latest versions are installed you don't really have to um, <coughs> sorry uh, don't have to really use the service which is there on your uh, laptop or install use your laptop for all these kind of activities so um, i have uh, my you know cloud shell ready so let me go back and pick some of the commands so i need to get credentials of my uh, of my cluster so i had created a cluster and it called it's called cube show and i already have uh you know i need to get the credential to run uh, so it's basically an access uh to run the uh cube ctl so it's nothing but it's getting the access and adding it into my source file so it adds it in my home uh, if you see that it's a configuration just it's just a configuration to access my cluster now uh you know, if I type kubectl, I have the command line for accessing. It's an API endpoint. This is the command line interface to run a couple of commands to access or to do some kind of operations on your cluster. So if you if you see, there are many commands here, right? I mean, it's it's a, it's again, you know, to understand all these things, you know, you need to go through a documentation which is here, you know. Uh, which is good and uh, it's a nice reference document and uh, understanding of all these commands is a must uh, if you want to master the Kubernetes, uh, it will it will uh, give you a kind of an understanding of how to manage uh, your cluster via kubectl uh, and Kubernetes also provides uh, a ui interface okay so it's not just a cli interface to manage your uh, you know you manage your cluster it also provides a ui interface but as a developer nobody uses a ui interface right so um, now what we will do is uh, we have got the credentials and uh, we need to uh, you know we need to see what what are those nodes which are running in in my cluster so i'll just you know get the nodes uh, i'll get the list of uh, nodes which is running so i had created it for three nodes and three nodes are running for me and then there is virtual node which is there and just imagine keep this in mind for that for next discussion virtual nodes um if you see uh it's kind of a different it looks very different from the normal nodes and it is virtually added and uh, and that's the beauty of uh, uh, of the virtual nodes which we will see in the next session okay so um cube uh ctl sorry get namespace 
So this is the namespaces, which is there. You can create a new namespace and uh, run a couple of things. So these are default namespaces. These are default uh, logically created uh, space uh, within your cluster. And uh, there is, you know, cube, CDL, get services. If I type, you know, there is only one service which is running, which is type of cluster IP. Uh, which is internal and uh, that is this is the service which is running so um, given this uh, we will go back and create a copy of uh, say azure oat right uh, we'll call it as azure oat and then we will open this go this uh, file and go back and copy this yaml file there so it's basically i've designed this desired state here so i'm going to copy it here and if you see did i copy it right mm. okay i did so i'm just copying this and storing this and now simple command so very simple i did write the way i want it it is only one time effort and once i do this uh, all i'll be doing is adding new things to here but or changing these things but it's uh, just a one time effort and uh, and then i just need to run that is apply this this state so i am just telling kubernetes that go back and apply this uh, you know the state which i have i want to run on the community uh, cluster and i'm just going here and uh, running this code and if you see there is deployment and service both gets added for uh, the code which we have done one is the back end one is the front end so there is a back end code which is there there is a front end code which is there and both of them are uh, running so very interesting and uh, you know we have just uh, created the service so if you go back and see get services so now you can see there are two services running and if you see you know the front end we had actually added a load balancer to it and there is an external ip which is there for the back end there was nothing added it is added to a cluster ip if you see that there is a cluster ip what does it mean is uh, you know it's a type of cluster ip that means it is accessible internally but it is not externally available so if you go to that ip address it can, you cannot do anything uh, with that ip so uh, to access this uh, you know just to see whether uh, my application is running or not i am just adding a watch um, let's see and then you can see that there is an external ip which is also there and i just need to copy this and run this because i am i can access this only through external ip so so this is a, a simple app uh, which is putting app so you can also access this ip address and uh, you know you can tell me you are a cat person or a dog person so it's actually a 52.154.255.255.178 so you can tell me if you are a cat person you like a cat or a dog uh, i like dogs so it depends on uh, your uh, interest so so basically if i keep refreshing this or i think i don't need to refresh i think if you keep adding you know clicking on uh, if you go to this vibes and click clicking it probably it might show you show us live um for this nice so so many people have clicked it so it's kind of uh, you know this is how you can actually deploy an application onto you know, communities right so um all i did was to define what i want i didn't even tell which node you need to run you know this is running uh, basically on uh basically on different different nodes right so if i have to give you this command where is that get nodes 
so i didn't i don't i don't even know where this uh, where this application is running in which node it is running and uh, i have no idea on um, you know uh, whether it's a virtual node or whether it is running on a different set of node or uh, you know what exactly is happening there uh, it is just a you know i just inform a kubernetes this is what i want and i want to run uh, one on one front end on the load balancer i this is the container which I want to run. And this is the replica set, I mean, replications I want to run, how many replications or how many pods I want to run. Uh, and then I said, this is the back end I want to run, which has to be in the back end of the service. It should not be a front end of the service. So I just told all these information. And similarly, I can even see, you know, um, kubectl, get pods, I, I don't know, this, this is the wrong command. Um, so you can see, you know, the number of pods running and I have no idea where it is running. So, and its status also you can check. So this is the, uh, you know, this, uh, this is the beauty of communities, right? And in a, in a complex world, if you see, uh, let me show you uh, one of the uh, example. Um, sock shop right and yeah this is an amazing uh, demo for running github but let me focus github microservice uh, does it have a uh, I don't know where there is docs. So you can actually use this and play around to do some kind of um, uh, microservice deployment. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to use this. And there is so many information available here on application design. So, so if you have to do in this way, right, you know, there are a couple of microservices you know if you see there are so many databases attached different kind of programming languages involved in uh, in designing this application this is a very simple application if you see there is it's nothing but an e-commerce site uh, with a front end and then there is so many uh, services it has it has a card service catalog payments order uh, some of them designed in java some of them designed in go and it uses q to manage stuff uh, so basically all these, uh, if you want to design and uh, you want to run it in a different, different uh, thing. So you would create different, different YAMLs for these and you're going to define, uh, design the way uh, you want to deploy this in the cluster. So uh, all you are going to do is to define uh, Kubernetes cluster via API, so via API server, right? And uh, this you know, containers, uh, you are actually building the way we built last time. So there is nothing new. So you are just designing your code and you are packaging it in the container the way we did it last time. And then you are hosting that package in the uh, mm -hmm. container registry uh, like we did uh, as a demo last, last week. And then uh, you are accessing that package in this structure, this YAML file, and then uh, and the way you want to define it and the way you want to plan architect it from a replica set, your replica you know, building that out and going back and, uh, and you're applying that in the Kubernetes cluster and bam, your code is running and you are able to access your uh, code and also scale that code because you can actually come back here and say you want to change this replica to different and then then go back and apply again and it automatically changes into replications of two right so all these things can be done there so um given these set right um so i just wanted to give this demo because next next week uh, we are going to do how to scale these applications uh, using virtual node and we will see how to what are the strategies you can use uh, to do the deployments um, and we will see uh, I, I mean i'll try to cover 
uh, ingress and other things, but again, doing a demo of all these things, you know, it's kind of, it will take a lot of time, but um, we will try and make sure that, uh, you know, uh, I'll cover most of those things uh, to understand, but to understand everything, right? Not just what I'm talking about, but to start with uh, day one, uh, if you are a beginner and if you already have some knowledge, uh, go for that basic videos of uh, video series of uh, burn and burns and there are core concepts uh, and webinars nicely defined and then there are you know go into deep dive and uh, some advanced things uh, which is required like patterns and the way you want to design stuff uh, i think this link will give you all the information so please go through that link it's a very well defined uh, learning path by burn and burns himself uh, who is a you know co-contributor uh, sorry creator of kubernetes he's the he's the first commit uh in the uh, kubernetes uh open source right so which is good so um thank you uh i i know there will be a lot of questions uh <laughs> it's been flooding in the chat vivek oh is it <laughs> yeah let me i i'll take them one by one bit. i'll help you with this oh last my time god I... there is you like it's going on i'll, I'll come with one by one okay I'll, okay I'll start at the beginning so to give everyone a uh what do you say a fair go uh, okay um uh, vivek if you would like to keep it at the beginnings at uh, the starting slide just to keep the uh this thing yeah and go on full screen so that, uh, i will the, the video otherwise look a bit looks a bit odd if people start speaking because things so that's why okay i'll start with dev jyoti's question first up so his question was that why does a kubelet need to ask the scheduler for starting a container why is this decision not autonomous for the worker why is kubelet need to ask the okay so um so basically you know uh, there might not be a uh, uh, resource available in the uh, worker node uh, to just go and just go and start off uh, and it needs to go back to the uh, it's basically the con it's just informing the master uh, the status of the worker node and master is the person who is actually uh, designing um, and you know defining what needs to be done, right? I mean, it, in any scenario, if you take any any other world, right? Um, uh, I could go back and start off my work, but I need definitely need my boss also to know, right? You know, uh, you know, to give me a direction, right? So uh, definitely in that in that analogy, if you take, um, you need to define. You know, the uh, master has to know, and master is a person who is define who's designing these things. Uh, you are just informing people. Okay. Uh, okay. Ne the next question was a difference between cube proxy and kubelet. And Udham has been quite generous with his uh, sharing his knowledge for the community. So I'll go through Udham's answers and you can add to it, Vivek. Sorry, uh, the I first... didn't get the question actually. I'll, I'll come to the question. So this, okay. the question was cube, cube proxy. What is the use of cube proxy? And how is the cube proxy different from a kubelet? See, cube proxy is a way to access your uh, node, and kubelet is uh, is a status. It's a binary where it is uh, collecting all the status. It is creating containers. It is restarting containers as well for some of the you know places, right? You know, if you see, uh, it is getting the status of the container. Um, I, I'll I'll uh, I will cover kubelet in detail in the next session uh you know uh, with all the kind of operations it does and what are those operations uh it covers you know getting logs of the container and getting the details of uh, the container running or not what is the status of the container container has different statuses uh, and all this information it collects and uh, provides it back to the master and master decides what needs to be done next okay uh, there's there's a view that QProxy is also responsible for communicating between the different ports and services. It also takes care of the cluster IP, uh, the node port Correct. service to establish communication. And uh, in whereas the kubelet is responsible for updating, uh, running, and 
uh, what do you say? Basically, running, updating the status or running the worker nodes, uh, kind yeah. of the utility which the master node or the Kubernetes master node is using to talk to the worker nodes. So it's like basically the communication, you can say, gateway. Or some, I mean, uh, it's a client server model, and some client has somebody from client has to talk to the master. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, and this is the binary which is doing that, and uh, yeah. it is informing information, giving the information, and also it is managing a couple of things within the uh, cluster. And there are actually these are this is not just the components of the worker node. There are uh, more components to it. Uh, there is FluentD uh, to manage the uh, logs of the oh, worker yes. node, and yeah. there is. And there is uh, something called as uh, uh, service D, right? You know where uh, you know it to always keep the kubelet running. You know, the kubelet should not go down, right? Mm -hmm. So, so kubelet kind of be, like a monitoring of the kubelet. Yeah, kubelet should always be running. So, mm -hmm. uh, those things are already. There. I mean, I mean, uh, it's an in-depth of uh, worker node yeah. which I have not gone into because that will be too much of discussion so you can actually figure that out uh, once you go into uh, into the internals of uh, how you how you can deploy this cluster uh, how to define how to design this cluster without the cloud provider so if you if you see the uh, you know uh, if you see the deployment of a kubernetes cluster without having cloud provider you know designing it for you uh, you going and setting it up i think that is where it will give you know you will understand all the concepts of uh, what all things is required to run this Achha. it's complicated Wait, uh, yeah another question are you planning to touch upon helm in the next session by any chance uh no uh okay. because uh, i'm talking about the scaling and that but we can do a session on helm separately if you want yeah, because the, there's a question from one of the audience where uh, deva is like where the hell comes and I, I have a background but i thought i'll just check in with you um helm so is a way to you can package all these things and uh run it as uh it's nothing but a way to do the deployments on the kubernetes cluster um and you can actually package it and sh share that package it's uh it's not and you, as of now, I'm just packaging the, I mean, running one YAML file, right? But as if I, I showed you in my microservice architecture and there were so many things you can actually package. Uh, so if you package it and want to run it, uh, Helm is actually the way to go. And yeah. we can actually discuss that. You know, if you want, we can do a separate session on Helm uh, and then you know, uh, obviously understand how exactly Helm works. Yeah, I mean, that's like building upon what we have learned so far. Yeah. Uh, following up on the same question on around the you know, packaging, uh, there was a uh, question from Ravindra, which is that, would, would it be better to pull, put all the different, like the service and the backend and the front end in a single YAML file or separate it out? Um, I mean, it's a kind of uh, the way the architecture you want to drive. Um, so backend front end uh, this is a simple application and uh, as i showed you the code uh, let me see um, have it open the code.yml is already open. no i i will show you most complicated one what? uh which is there in my code that are it's in document go where is that microservices is deployment and that is kubernetes and there is uh, yeah so so if you see you know they have actually defined it in a complete uh, yaml right the complete demo is there in the YAML file, but if it, it is always good to separate it out for your management and uh, use Helm to package it in a right way. Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, there was another thing. Okay. This is, uh, I have pasted the link to the uh, 
Kubernetes 50 days thing that's already there with the audience. So they can pick it up yeah. from there. But, uh, there was a question from Nagendra sir that if I'm going to design these YAMLs, and as you showed that they can actually get quite big. So it's the better practice to divide them. Is there any editor or UI which helps creating these YAMLs given that there's a particular syntax and a particular format which has to be followed? And there was a suggestion from Visual uh, Studio, you have extensions. Yeah, Visual uh, Studio extensions, yeah. You have extensions to use that. YAML, uh, you know, YAML extension is there. In fact, it gives you if there is a if you are doing something wrong, it is actually showing. I mean, if you see my uh, let me share screen. I'm actually on mobile data now, some internet issue. <laughs> so if you see the it's coming up, Vivek, just give it a moment. Select a if you see this right, and you know, it's an easier way to do it. Uh, right? No, and and we're not able to see it, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, now it's come up. Yeah, <laughs> you can see this, right? Yeah, so yeah. if I go on on hover it, right, I can see a yeah. couple of things, right? You know, if you yeah. hover, you know, it you can see, and this is easier way to design it. You know, if I, I can say I can close these things, so. You don't need to really see all the things. As I told you, it's one-time effort. And if you see, there is, I've closed all the things and I've only opened the deployment one, which is required. And I just need to go back and edit these things. Okay, fine. So that was, uh, uh, okay, that takes care of the question around DK. So the question around uh, the daemon set is, I think there are quite a few questions on daemon set that, uh, demon set applies all namespaces as it is at node level. Is that a correct understanding? No, no you need to give. You need to give. Uh, I know. Sorry, yeah, sorry. I mean. Sorry, uh, I think the question around is that that when we are using the demon set and we have one copy of the pod in every what is or the the container in every pod. Every uh, pod. Then what happens to the namespace? I mean, how is the namespace? Uh, what do you say? Conflict it is up to you how you define the daemon set. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to define the daemon set at node level. Uh, you don't need to name it under any namespace. Mm -hmm. But if you are naming it under any namespace, it will run it in that namespace. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's what Sanjay also mentioned. The daemon set is used to run for run pod in all nodes. I think if you create a daemon set with a namespace, then it will run it a, in the same namespace in all nodes. Yes. And so on and so forth. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, there was a question from Chaitanya. I believe that uh, can you limit resources in which pod can uh, defining the resource per uh, are the limits on CPU and memory defined in the YAML file per pod or is it per uh, is it at a higher level? The, the, the CPU limits you remember, Vivek, you showed yeah, us. It's, it's a it's per pod. Mm -hmm. Um, it's basically I have defined it around the pod itself so if you see this code uh, uh yeah let it come up yeah yeah it's come up yes so it's if you see this code for uh, this backend i am actually defining it in the specific yeah. to that yeah. pod yeah. so specific to that image which i am running i can have many containers under this okay so it's not just one container i've just given one container here i can have one for more example container. yeah yeah, exactly. this is an example, but I can copy this and create one more container mm -hmm. uh, on and use a different image, mm -hmm. uh, but use the similar uh, resource. So it's basically mm -hmm. per pod. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a question is that how can I connect nodes from different network under one master node in the cluster? Is that something you will cover in the advanced topic? And then we can leave this question. I, uh, I didn't get the question. So the question was, how, how can, can I, I connect nodes from different networks under one master node in the cluster? Or different networks? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, while you are defining the cluster, the network is defined. So I don't know whether you can do it. I'm, I'll have to go back and check. I'm, I have, mm, I don't know hmm. yeah, how I can you connect that different nodes uh, I have uh, one second it. is it it's from Kiran Kiran can you unmute yourself and probably share your question again and give a bit of context around it 
Yeah, sure. So I'm planning on uh, setup. Uh, I'm planning on making the setup around distributed processing using Kubernetes, right? Mm -hmm. So can I connect a worker node from a different network under the same master node where uh, multiple worker nodes can connect from different networks? Okay. Is it possible? That's a, that's a good question, but I have I have not tried it before. So, Kiran, when you say different networks, what do you mean by that? Are you talking about, like, say, your one worker node is an on-prem and another worker node is an AWS and another third one is an um, GCP? Yeah, is yeah. that kind of a situation? That's exactly what so, I'm um, so, you can use that way with the virtual nodes. I did talk about okay. virtual node, if you remember, um, which I'm going to cover in my next topic. Uh, you can actually create a virtual node to your master node uh, and then use that virtual node. So basically the way virtual kubelet works, let me show you this, right? Um, Sorry, my network is so bad. I'm on phone yeah. network. Yeah, yeah. I'm not able to type though. But you can see this virtual node here, right? Yes, we can. Yes. So yes. this virtual node, you can actually install uh, your this virtual node binaries uh, in your um, uh, wherever the other network is, and you can actually connect that to the master node here. So you can use it in that way. Okay. okay. You can definitely use virtual nodes. So basically you are trying to do a distributed, right? You are trying to do a distributed. So yes. ultimately what is there on the virtual node is nothing but the, um, you know, cube, uh, cubelet, which is there, right? And ultimately the worker node is run through cubelet and install kubelet wherever you want uh, with the uh, virtual node uh, act in you know, a virtual node binaries and you connect that with the uh, virtual node uh, connect with the uh, uh, connect with the master node and then you should be able to use it a uh, question here Vivek. so the virtual okay, so node... how can i cut that virtual node how, how do you connect virtual node? We, we will see that in the next session. Uh, I'll, uh, anyways, I have a demo for that. Uh, there, I mean, obviously it is again defined here in the in the, your YAML file, uh, how you can, uh, how do, where do you want these uh, containers to run uh, in the virtual node or in the, your node, right? Where, you know, just to give you that information, here is the node selector, right? You are selecting a node, telling Linux box yes. and things. There you can actually define you want virtual node and all the stuff. Okay. I'll show uh, you that uh, demo next. And time. any network challenges I need to take care of? Uh, network challenges wise, um, I mean there is no network challenge because once it is connected to the uh, master node, it works similar to the uh, similar to the way it works for the node wise because ultimately the containers everything is there on the container registry so whenever you specify a new container uh, it is actually pulling the data from the container registry so uh, the wherever you have hosted your container registry uh, that is you know it has to be near to your virtual node uh, service Uh, okay. Um, moving on to the oh. next question. Uh, okay, sorry, Chaitanya. Does it answer your question, or you still have something? Probably because what you can do. Yeah, one no, there is, uh, what what I can give you is uh, I can give you the virtual node uh, uh, documentation. So you can actually f it, it's called virtual kubelets. It's an actually CNCF uh, project. It's not even Microsoft project. It I mean it was created by Microsoft, but it is. Uh, I know it has been open sourced and it is part of the CNCF. So uh, you can actually take a look at it. This, the use cases of virtual node uh, is very varied. Okay. And uh, basically there people are trying to bring, uh, bring 
Kubernetes you know, concepts into the IoT systems as well. So you can install container and uh, virtual kubelets on these uh, IoT pro, you know, uh, IoT devices which you have and run certain mm -hmm. things uh, directly on these IoT devices. So there are so many use cases of that. Uh, you know, you can take a look at it. But I, anyways, next week I'm uh, next. Uh, I know next session which is there on March sixth. Uh, we will see a demo of that. And I've anyways pasted the virtualkubelet.io uh, uh, website to the audience so they can have a look at it if they are interested in understanding a bit more. Uh, okay. There was one question from... One second. Uh, okay, there was a... Uh, the, uh, Vivek, can you just elaborate, maybe a short overview of the cloud shell which you opened up as in... It's basically for accessing, it's like, it's a bit like a, a readily available Azure CLI, right? From your browser. Yes. I mean, it, it's readily available. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, in a kind of a Linux box kind of a thing you get create and you just use that for running your commands. Yeah, that's fine. So and yeah. by the way, this get comes up with uh, all the install when, when you deploy this, uh it, it it is attached to a storage uh it is attached to a storage and it comes up with everything installed like the python installed docker new version installed cube ctl installed uh all the things which is required git git is installed everything is ready made for you mm -hmm. so if you want to run anything you want to run such kind of commands and connect with some of the things and you can keep it running so there is no uh, not necessarily you need to close it as well and there's a minimum cost for it but you can keep it running as well because you you can use the storage and you can store the code and you know just use that uh, to access your various things run azure cli as well. also latest one will be installed on that yeah okay another question from sanjay is that that does azure kubernetes service come with its own flavor of ingress controller or we can use any other ingress controller also if possible or if available I mean, does aks provide that flexibility yeah you can yeah yeah flexibility is there you can okay um okay another one is that uh, to, 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 okay this one this is this is related to the same question which we were discussing with kiran as in virtual nodes and all that stuff so he's saying that kubernetes supports different network plugins like cni calico uh, AWS has yes. its own plugin, which you, using which you can create separate pods in different virtual networks. And again, this is getting into specific of Kubernetes networking, which is not only an advanced topic, but probably needs a, a more of a understanding before we start discussing it. Yes. So I think Kiran probably would be a good idea to check it out a bit more. And then you can probably reach out to Vivek with the most. That is uh, the CNI and other things provides a way to run pods. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the Kiran's question was he wants to run nodes uh, in a distributed yeah. node, node wise. And, you know, he wants to create a completely different node and use it mm -hmm. under the cluster. So that is where the virtual node comes into picture. Okay, uh, this is a different question, but I think probably a common question. The question is that, oh, what is the certifications available for Kubernetes and how to start preparing? Uh, hang on, uh, uh, Vivek, aren't you planning something next week around the same thing or uh, with um, Azure developer days on this certification thing? I remember- uh, oh, that, uh, that one, Azure, uh... The, oh, that I mean, was Azure certification, not Kubernetes. That certification. is Azure certifications. Yeah, uh, certifications. But I think for here, there are three types of certifications for communities. One is uh, for administrators, uh, and one is for developers, uh, and the other is uh, for security. So there are three, and security is a pretty new one, uh, but there are three set of things. So as I told you, uh, to start with uh, the certification and other things, uh, the best way to learn, which I've heard from various people who have done certification is that, you know, they need to go back and uh, try and deploy communities the hard way, 
right? And uh, not the easiest way like I have deployed. I go to cloud and I just select some buttons and say deploy and I have the cluster ready with all the things, networking and all the things is ready. Uh, but if you do try and set it up on your own uh, as a cluster and see how exactly it works, uh, you will understand all the components of Kubernetes and how it is architected and how exactly this works. Uh, and after that, you know, you can, uh, you know, understanding the way you want to define these YAMLs and manage these YAMLs uh, and also understand uh, some of the problems, right? And what happens in uh, pod life cycle, right? There is a pod life cycle, you know, it can be running state, it can uh, be in a different state, like uh, it is still says executing and all those things. So there are life cycles of pod. So if you understand all these things, right, and you can easily go back and write certification. Uh, but I would, you know, go back and see if uh, you can do a couple of courses. Uh, I think that is, that will help. Okay. Uh, if you're planning a, to take certification. Yeah. So. There was a question around the sock shop. So I've shared the website URL. People wanted to know what the GitHub link for the microservice application. So that's done. Okay. Um, to, there was another question again on the same lines of around networking where can the master cube master be in one cloud control a worker no, node which is on a different cloud provider and whether it's a practically valid scenario again getting into Kubernetes yeah. networking. I, I'm not I've never tried yeah, no no and as, actually the point is these are like edge cases which yeah. most people would not have tried it out yeah and uh, and and it's a kind of uh, I wouldn't even suggest that kind of cases because see if you want to run so, uh, as a master controller scheduler and everything uh, it should be at one place given the security given the network issues uh, various things right so it would be good uh, no here a, i would just slightly digress uh, vivek but the reason is that for whatever reason some enterprises are very interested in this and which is where uh, products like um, you know, there are when some most of the cloud providers are doing something on these lines, so like AWS Outposts or and no, you can, you can definitely do it. You know, do it. I mean, I would suggest not to. So that yeah, is no, I understand what you're saying. The reason, is that, yeah. when it, the reason is that what you're saying is that network delays can create weird behaviors and applications which are completely otherwise not possible and very difficult to even figure out or address. Yep. So and then that's something which uh, a lot of people don't realize it. And for example, even the simple something as simple as when we have active and passive data centers, if there's a millisecond or a microsecond delay between them and syncing information. It can lead to weird behaviors. So if people have not seen it, it's not. Uh, I mean, there are challenges doing multi-cloud uh, Kubernetes clusters for sure. Okay. Yep. Uh, another question from Sanjay is that there's does. Amazon, sorry, Azure Kubernetes service support Istio, which is a service mesh by default, or is there another service, any other, you know, other service mesh service available in Azure Kubernetes service? Yeah, I mean, you can use Istio uh, and there is uh, Ingress, which is already there. Yeah, and uh, I think he's excited about you covering virtual Kubernetes in the next session. So he's expect he's really you know waiting for your next session <laughs> once uh, virtual Kubernetes on. So apart from that, there were a couple of questions on Helm again, which we will we'll probably do it in a different session. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. He's asking a question here. I'm sorry. Can you mute yourself, whoever? Okay. Uh, there's another question here, which is talks about, uh, sorry, I was trying to lost question here. Uh, yeah, do you have any, uh, is there any sample code where the ETCD, which you mentioned, remember, which was the database, which uh, Kubernetes was using, if that is an external database, or he's providing that, can you provide a example code where container interact with external DB? I'm not sure if he mean, means the external DB, which is used for storing configuration data in Kubernetes or an application level, but uh, yeah, I, think I mean, I think that's not possible. I mean, like it's, 
second comes back to edge case though uh okay for me um see the the reason why exit is in the memory database is because we want to access the status of the cluster uh much faster than the way it is you know if i had to not to i mean if i had not used in memory database right mm -hmm. so i would want the status information pretty fast to make a decision on running my pods in different nodes i think that way uh, that way i would keep it on same place hmm. okay fine uh okay another question this is an interesting one that uh, in case say there is a challenge with uh, you know the yaml or you know we make there's a human error so what is the best way to debug if there are challenges with the deployment when what are the tools or frameworks or anything available when does given it when how do you debug a deployment challenge that's a question from sumant which i think is a interesting one yeah i mean obviously the way we there is no easier way mm -hmm. <laughs> so we'll have to figure it out with our logs with our you know prometheus or what, wherever the challenge is coming from i mean it if it is a uh, you know the error if it is human error in terms of indentation and other things you can easily figure out via visual studio mm -hmm. uh, and if it is a uh, if it is something which you addressed the wrong names and other things some errors will throw up if you're running uh, uh, if you just go and apply in the cube ctl and it will some error will throw up um, but if that is something not logical error uh, i mean not the you know uh, not the indentation or the naming references errors uh, if it is something uh, application wise and other things so then you will have to debug it in the norm way like in the logs and you are uh, you know distributed tracing um, and metrics other things which you usually do uh, you you can figure that out but again there are uh, certain uh, tools uh, like cube flow and i think not cube flow there's one tool from infra cloud i forgot the name but you can usually use those certain tools there there are a couple of tools for sure there are Hmm. Okay, I remember in your uh, the Kubernetes uh, path which you shared, no, the fifty days one. There is a section on best practices as well. So probably yes. that might give you some, give the audience some more uh, ideas around it. So probably yeah. they can go and refer that. Yes, I mean uh, there are. I mean there is architecture pattern as well, like how you want to architect this. Uh, you know how you want to architect an application, and there are a couple of. Uh, and a couple of sections where uh, you can uh, figure out the architectural details uh, like how you want to deploy it and other things are uh, everything has been defined there so i think you can go and people can go and download that pdf and uh, take a look at it once hmm. yeah fine uh, to, okay the okay uh, sanjay has a question which i think uh, i'm not understanding completely he says it virtual kubelet on iot devices versus k3s i'm not sure what k3s is on iot device i'm not sure what yeah k3s is a you know as a, a, a smaller version which is nothing but a cube uh kubelet uh, as well so i'll i'll cover that anyways in the next okay. session so i can also talk about k3s for now virtual hmm. kubelet versus k3s as well okay and um, to okay one is after that i think that kind of covers most of the questions we have there's one two questions interesting questions later um kiran has asked the question that can you provide uh, some information where we can connect with you see kiran uh, vivek has been gracious at sharing all his social media handles uh, at least at least the twitter ones so he's it's there on the bangalore jug uh, uh what do you say the meetup itself it's vivek underscore shridha so you can probably connect with him on twitter and follow him um if you have anything else to add vivek if there's another medium in case yeah, linkedin is there i mean i'm available on linkedin 
uh, you just type Vivek Sridhar, Microsoft, probably I'm, I'm the only one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, yeah, you can. So, you can, you can uh, by, by the way, if you go up, uh, Kiran, if you go on to uh, the Bangalore Jug LinkedIn page, I've tagged Vivek so many times, you got bored by now. So, <laughs> he's there in every goddamn post we have for the last two weeks. So, um, yeah, sure. Yeah, and uh, okay, this is a question from interesting question, Ravindra. He's like, and I think this is a question which I would prefer the audience also to give their views. Is that with your experience around Kubernetes, what are the difficult or challenging parts of Kubernetes related tasks in real world projects? So basically, when say an organization is going to Kubernetes or they are there, so what is the challenges getting into the Kubernetes world and what are the challenges remaining in the Kubernetes to be remaining in it? So that's a, I, I, that's a very, very good question, actually. Um, there are, I mean, the challenge is you are completely, uh, if you're moving from a, if you're start, getting started with Kubernetes, it's, it's easier. But if you are moving your applications from already available applications to Kubernetes and uh, that challenge always remains and it's still, you know, it's still not very friendly to developers, in fact. Right, and it's you know nobody's we nobody's addressing the development challenge there, like how do I, uh, how do I have these uh, cluster ready with developers, right? And how can I a developer use it in his environment uh, to run these things? That's where K three and other things can help as well. But uh, but there are challenges there, and uh, overall understanding of uh, Kubernetes uh, is a challenge if you come from a traditional mindset. Right. We, we as a developers from last 15 years working in a traditional ways, uh, we have been introduced into Kubernetes world. Uh, how does most of these things get converted into you know, Kubernetes world is, is always a question for all of us. And uh, I you know the more I read about Kubernetes, the more I work on it, the more I do hands-on, I learn so many new things about it. Um, and that's the... That's the crux of it, I think so. Um, uh, understanding it is little bit, uh, little bit difficult for all of us. Uh, probably uh, more and more if you go do hands on, probably that will give you uh, clarity on the on the way it works and the way you can use it. Um, and there is no much documentation as well. Uh, there are a couple of documentation, but there is again now somebody talked about you know running uh in a distributed way the you know the nodes to be installed in a distributed way i mean no, there is no such documentation i have not seen that or i have not figured it out so now it's kind of a question where i will also go back and you know read about it so you'll keep learning these new things there yeah, yeah there's quite a few interesting thoughts coming on there uh, uh there was a question on uh I think uh, the, the couple of questions on, you know, as, a, as somebody who's starting off and, you know, where uh, basically uh, there's a question from someone that he doesn't have any I, any background on containers and Kubernetes. So I believe for Kubernetes, the learning path which uh, Vivek has shared is extremely good because it starts from the basics and slowly builds on it. And uh, then uh, a lot of other, Sanjay has again shared a couple of links on the internet where you know, they, you can start off with the basics of containers and other things. So, because yeah, I, yeah. I understand the, the general question from the audience is that, you know, how do I get into the world of containers? Because it's, it's not like a, there's a standard defined path and there are edge cases which you will come across more often than not uh, when you're trying to, you know, address this. So um, my only two cents to hear is, uh, you know, go back and uh, go back and uh, you know, spend time in terms of doing something hands-on, like build yourself, build an application um, and containerize that application. If you're well-versed in Java, take that Java Spring Boot uh, application and build it an, in, a, in a traditional way, build it in a traditional way and convert it that into a containerized application and take that containerized application to Kubernetes and try and scale that using various uh, 
various uh, uh, parts of the community like auto scaling uh, hop, you know, node scaling pod scaling which is there which we are going to anyways talk about it next session but you know you can obviously play around it uh, understand containers containers is very important uh, because if you know containers then only you can orchestrate it so if you are getting started with uh, you know getting started with container world don't go jump into kubernetes go first and learn containers and then jump into kubernetes uh, you know via the 50 days uh, into kubernetes uh, very good sessions from mm -hmm. Brendan Burns there, uh, which is listed out, uh, you know, easy way to understand. He himself uh, talking about uh, how exactly this works and what is uh, each and every aspects of uh, Kubernetes cluster. So it's very nice. Mm. Okay, we make a request for you that if possible in the next session, could you just add one slide on the, uh, you know, if there are any projects open source or proprietary, which uh, look uh, into the you know the monitoring and tracing aspects of Kubernetes containers because there's a question just coming multiple times in the chat like how like in if I want to do application debugging then remote debugging is not practical then uh, this Sanjay is referring to a project as telepresence or scaffold so basically probably a, a one slide on the available tools which can do which can help with debugging in kubernetes yeah definitely are, i can do that yeah that that, yeah. that is at least that's like a, a starting point for the audience that fine there are these tools and then you have to go and explore them because see we can't get into each tool in detail on in one session that would be unfair on both our audience and the uh, speaker so it's more like yes this is the basics and you then let them go and explore a bit more okay